I want to, uh, you to make note that I have my iPad with me. And it's, uh, you know, I've watched and I see how effectively they're used. And I don't want to be left out. I don't want to be accused of not being up with things. So my sermon's right here in my iPad. And what's good about it is everywhere I go with my iPad, my sermon is with me. So it's very convenient. This morning we're uh, continuing the series, The I Am's, The Seven I Am's. Our pastor's been preaching on those. You know that uh, he's already preached about uh, I am uh, the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the good shepherd. Last week, I'm the resurrection and the life. Next week, he'll preach on the vine. And this week... Our saying, our statement is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Profound statement. It'd be really good to have our pastor here to preach on this with all the wisdom and, you know, fresh insight that he brings us. I'd like to hear him preach on this very subject. So we'll miss him not being here to do that. He's a... He's just a good preacher, and uh, he brings the Word with clarity. He preaches from the Word, and so we're uh, thankful for him. You know, he said last week he's going to listen to this sermon when he got back, so I wanted to be sure up front to say something good about him. And, <laughs> but uh, I'm only kidding. I do mean every word of that. We're proud of our pastor, and... We do uh, appreciate his great preaching, appreciate his family. Well, today we're looking at uh, John 14. We're going to look at the question, how can we know the way? But look at the scripture from John chapter 14, starting, of course, in verse 1. John 14, verse 1, this is a scripture that's used a lot at funerals as comfort. Because it is comforting, should be comforting to us. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so... I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth. And the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You know, here in chapter 14, Jesus is realizing how troubled the disciples are. And he's uh, wanting to comfort them, trying to help them with their troubled spirit. And you recall what's led up to this time. Chapter 13 would uh, tell us a lot of what happened because that is the, what we call the Last Supper, the night before uh, the crucifixion. But in the past three years, the disciples had been with Jesus. They'd lived with him day and night. What, what? <laughs> I thought you were telling me I wasn't. Sorry, y'all are hearing okay. Yeah. I, uh, uh, they had been with uh, Jesus day and night, and they had learned and listened to him preach, and uh, they knew how he could perform miracles. They had uh, learned to know him and to grow in him. It's interesting if you look at the way the titles that the disciples used for Jesus, they grew in him, and it's evident in the titles that they used. 
You know, when they first saw Jesus, they knew that he was a man of authority and they called him sir. And then they saw him calm the seas and they called him master, master of all things. And then uh, they heard him teach and they called him rabbi or teacher. They, uh, through Peter especially, they, uh, Jesus revealed to him them that he was the Christ and they called him the Christ. And then, you know, after the resurrection, he appeared to the disciples and they called him Lord. So they grew. They grew in their knowledge of Jesus. Uh, but now, <laughs> Jesus was leaving them. And he had said to them, where I'm going, you can't come. They were confused and they were troubled. And uh, they saw the threats on Jesus' life and they felt threatened themselves and wondered about their own lives. So Jesus uh, wanted to tell them some things as he was leaving, especially directly to them and with them uh, privately, I think. And so he gathered them together in the upper room for the last, what we call the last supper, the last meeting with them. In that upper room, some of you have been there, I guess. You know how beautiful, how simple the room is. It's a place for a quiet meeting like Jesus would have. One time I was there and we prayed, our group prayed that we'd be able to have communion there in that room undisturbed. And there are people coming through all the time, all the time. The steps are worn out where people, groups are coming through. We had our communion without one other person coming through. It was a great time. But he was there in that upper room and uh, he started teaching them and showing them more about what it was going to be like after he was gone. And one of the things he did was wash the disciples' feet. You know that. Verse 5 of chapter 13 says, then he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, it was very common in those days when you entered a home that the people there would be sure that your feet were washed. It was a sign of hospitality, of welcome, because your feet would get dirty with sandals on. But here was the Son of God, Jesus, washing the feet of his disciples. It was a humble move on his part and he told them you should do the same thing as I'm doing now, of course Peter Peter said you're not going to wash my feet <laughs> and Jesus said to him if I don't wash your feet Peter then you don't really have anything to do with me uh, the words that he was saying you know we could we could look at those and uh, say that Jesus was saying unless Unless I wash away your sins by the atoning blood of Christ, then you don't really have a relationship with me. A lot of significance to that washing of the feet. But if you look at verse 11, it says that not of all, all of those were not clean. Am I looking at verse 11? Let's go back and see. Verse 11, yeah. For he knew the one who was betraying him. There was one going to betray him, one that was not clean. Uh, Judas had had his feet washed, but he had fallen into the hands of Satan. And in doing that, he was betraying Jesus. Jesus knew this beforehand. So he confronted him here. You know that he identified or let Judas know that he knew who he was and who was going to betray him. The other disciples didn't know at that time. Uh, they knew that someone was portraying him, but they didn't know who it was. They even wondered if it might be them, me. But Judas left the room, and the uh, disciples thought, you know, they just thought maybe he's leaving to go buy something because he had the money. But the truth was, he was leaving, and with him was the Satan power that had been a tension between Jesus and between Judas all that time. So the next verses, Jesus says, you know, with Judas gone, now the Son of Man can be glorified. Five times he says that. So it was significant that uh, Jesus recognized, identified, confronted, uh, 
the man that was going to betray him. Then uh, he said to them, verse 34 and 35, I'm giving you a new commandment. A new commandment that you love one another. And I'll be gone, and this is the way that men can continue to know that you're my disciples. Because of the love that you'll share. He said, uh, you little children, he called them little children. He said, you can uh, show that love as you go. And that's the way that you can live through my being gone is by showing that love and letting others know that you're my followers. Then uh, Peter, (laughs) the last verse is there. Say Peter was still searching for answers. And he said, Jesus, where are you going? He said, uh, I'll go with you. I want to go with you now. I'll lay down my life for you. Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. So the Last Supper and significant kinds of things that uh, were shown there, You can just imagine, I can, that the disciples must have been very bewildered. They must have been uh, discouraged because Jesus said he's going away. He said uh, he's going to die, that one of them was going to deny him, and that Peter, one of the leaders of the disciples, was going to disown him three times. And already Jesus had said to them that they would fall away during these times. So it must have been a very discouraging time for the disciples. And that brought Jesus to the point that we see recorded in chapter 14, where he says to them, Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. The heart, you remember, the heart in the scripture is talking about our very essence, the essence of our being. And he says, I know you're troubled, you're agitated, stirred up down in the very essence of your being. But don't be troubled. (laughs) Now, it's not recorded here, but I believe the disciples may have said, that is easy for you to say, man. That's easy for you to say. Don't be troubled. Don't don't just let that flip away out of you without uh, knowing that it's uh, significant. The disciples said, it's significant to us. But the truth of the matter is that we know that Jesus at times was troubled also. You know, when Lazarus died and Martha and Mary asked him to come, and he got to uh, where Lazarus had been buried and they, Mary was weeping and there were others that were weeping with him. And the Bible says that he was troubled inside. He was very troubled to see his own friend Lazarus dead died, but he's also troubled, doesn't spell it out there, but you know that he must have been troubled to know the sin that had caused death to come into our life, into life, into the lives of his people. So he was troubled. He was troubled, it says, just like we read about when he confronted uh, Judas. It says he was troubled. He was losing a friend. He was losing one who had followed him and one who should have been loyal to him. And he had deserted him, betrayed him. So certainly, he was disturbed by that. Later on, after the crucifixion, you know that he's going to be in agony at Gethsemane. Jesus uh, knew what trouble was. And he had had, uh, suffered and had known trouble. So... When he said, do not be troubled, he, he could uh, identify with the disciples. But he wasn't satisfied there. He said, I want to show you some ways that you can overcome trouble. That's the way it is with us. You know, when he tells us, do not or do, he doesn't just leave us there. He helps us understand what he said, and he helps us. He'll be willing to help us. So he wanted to help the disciples. He said, let me tell you how you can overcome this trouble in your life. So there's about three things there that talk about how you can overcome the trouble. Uh, Number one, uh, number one, 
What does he say? Trust in God and trust also in me. Believe in God and believe also in me. He could have said believe in me and believe also in God because they were one and the same. If you go on in this chapter beyond what we've read, he points out that he and the Father are the same. The Father's in me and I'm in the Father. And the words that you hear me say are words that come from the Father, he says. And then finally, uh, in the chapter, he says, when I leave, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm bringing to you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be my presence in you. So trust in me. Trust in me that I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm leaving, but I'm leaving you with the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So trust in me. It's very, very critical to our relationship to God, isn't it? To Christ, that we trust him. And then second, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, I, Jesus, am going to prepare a place for you. It was a promise that was coming from him, directed to them. He was the one that was going to prepare that place in his father's house. And he's saying to them, I hold the key. I'm the one that holds the key to that place. So be encouraged because you know me, and by knowing me, you have the entrance into that kingdom. You have the entrance into that house. I'm preparing it just for you. It's yours. Uh, it is prepared for you in a, in a unique way and prepared for you uniquely. It is a place that I'm preparing for you. And then third, what does he say? He says, don't be <laughs> troubled. I'm coming back. I'll come back and get you that where I am, you may be also. So great promises that Jesus has to help the disciples but still Thomas says what Lord we don't even know where we're going how can we know the way Jesus uh, had already said to them you know the way you know the way they should know the way he said you know the way Thomas said how can we know the way we don't even know where you're going so what does Jesus say? How can we know the way? And Jesus responds to that. But think about the question. That's the question of the day, really. That's the title of the sermon today, is how can we know the way? How can we know the way through this wilderness of life? How can we find that path that God has intended for us, each one of us, for that purpose and the plan that he has for our life? And how can we find that way to eternal life where he's preparing a place for us? How can we find the way? What does Jesus say to him? He said, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The I am, the way that it's used in the Greek... When you say, I am referring to yourself, it's a very powerful statement. It could be interpreted, I and only I am. He's saying to Thomas, I and only I, Thomas. And then look, uh, what does it say? It uses the definite article, the way, the truth, the life. It's not a way, a way, uh, any way, another way, it is the way. Some of you uh, would remember Donna who had a talk show once upon a time. Somebody told me about it. I'm not old enough to remember it, but some of you do, I'm sure. <laughs> but Donna who was interviewing uh, the president of the Southern Seminary, Dr. Albert Moeller. And they were talking about this. And Donna who said to Dr. Moeller, you don't really believe that, do you? Dr. Moeller said, yes, I believe that. Don Who said, you believe there's no other way to Christ, no other way to God except through Christ. Dr. Moeller said, yes, that's what I believe. He said, you can't believe that. He said, I do believe that because it comes from the Word of God. And Don Who said, that is the most egotistical, selfish statement I have ever heard in my life. Do you know how many people you're eliminating from their way to God because they sincerely believe they know the way to God other than through Christ? 
But Jesus said, no. There's no other way. And that's what Albert Moeller uh, proclaimed that day in a very uh, good way, a way that I was proud of. You see, uh, through Jesus, we find not only the ultimate meaning for life on this earth, but we find the only way to really know the Father in heaven and have eternal life with Him. Now, I'm going to tell you about being initiated into a fraternity when I was down at Alabama. I'm not recommending fraternity life to anybody and certainly not the hazing that goes on. And most of that's been eliminated, I think. But the last night of the initiation, we were paired off, the pledges were, and we were taken by the brothers. They were called brothers. Didn't much act like it, but... They were taking us to places and dropping us off, and we were supposed to find our way back to Tuscaloosa. I learned later that where the buddy of mine and I were taken was close to Florence, Alabama, about three hours from Tuscaloosa. They took us, left the paved roads. They got on country roads. They got to a cow path just about where they dropped us off. We had a blanket, army blanket. We had the paddle that was supposed to take with us anywhere we go, And we had our undershorts. It was 32 degrees freezing outside. They left us. Now I promise you, I have never felt lost more than I was that night. I knew what it meant to be lost. I had no idea the way out. We had rode little trails going this way and going this way. We had no idea we were lost. It was dark. We were in the dark. It was almost pitch dark. We just uh, kind of stumbled around and took a chance and went one way. And after about an hour, hour and a half, we happened up on a paved road. And we had some hope coming to us right away when we found that paved road. But we still wondered if we didn't just stand there in the dark. And we did. Because we didn't know whether you go that way to Tuscaloosa or you go that way to Tuscaloosa. So we were standing there watching as a light came. We saw a light way off in the distance and it came, got closer and closer to us and it lit the place up where we were and turned out it was a bus. And the driver stopped. I believe till yet he was an angel. (laughs) He stopped and he opened the door and he said, what's going on? And we explained to him what was going on and he said, come on. He said, you get on the bus. I'm going to Tuscaloosa. I'll take you there. I said, uh, we don't have any money. He said, doesn't matter, I'll take care of it. So we went to the back of the bus, and I promise you, there's never, ever been a time that I was more relieved and rested and at peace. And when I found that place on the bus, could cover up with that blanket, good and warm, trust the driver that he's going to take us. He took us all the way to Tuscaloosa. Well, that's kind of a weak analogy when you try to apply that to Jesus saying, I'm the way. But there's a lot of commonality in there. There's a lot of truth in it. You know, there's a lot of people today that are lost. They're as lost as anybody possibly could be. They don't have any idea how to get out of the situation they're in. They're in trouble. They're troubled. (laughs) They don't know the way. They don't know what the destination really is. They don't much know where they really want to go. And they're in the dark. Really in the dark. Darkness of the world. So they stumble along and many of them are looking and are seeking and thank you, thankful that they are. But they stumble along and finally someone helps them understand where they are. It's like being on that pavement. They have some hope. They hear the way out. And they're being told, by the way, that if you go that way, you're going to find an eternity with God. If you go that way, it's not going to be that pleasant. It's going to be an eternity in a place called hell. So they wait, and the light comes. Jesus comes, and he is the light, is what it says. And he lights up. The air around them lights up their hearts. And he says, come on. I'll take you. I know where you, we need to go. And I'll take you. And I've paid already the price. 
And I promise you there's no rest, no peace. Those of you that have, and most of you know, that when you came to that place, there's no peace, no rest like it. You know, Jesus said, Come to me who are heavy laden, who are uh, weary, weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest in Jesus. You know, I know <laughs> there's nothing to compare with it. You've uh, really found what it means when you've come to that place that you accept Him. Jesus uh, makes it known that there's no other way instead of being troubled, just know and trust Him and walk daily in the faith because He's the way. And He'll lead us exactly where we need to go. The destination that He knows is for us. So Jesus says, I'm the way. And He says, I'm the truth. And that raises the question, what's truth? Remember how Pontius Pilate was questioning Jesus when he was at trial before Him? And uh, it asked a lot of questions, but... Pilate had heard that Jesus had said that he was a king. He was a king of a kingdom that was not of this earth. And Pilate said to him, are you a king? And Jesus answered him from the scripture. I mean, it's recorded in the scripture, the, chain, uh, the, the answer that he gave to him. Jesus said in chapter 18 of John, verse 37, You say correctly that I'm a king. For this I've been born, and for this I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. To bear witness to the truth. That's why Jesus came. Pilate's response was what? What is truth? And that's another question that's hard to get your uh, thoughts around and to describe really is truth. We just uh, sang though about the truth coming into the world. And that was through Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus came as the Word, capital W. He came in the world as the Word. And the Scripture says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, ever since, <laughs> there's been a God, whatever, the, however you define that. Even before the beginning, Jesus was with God. So Jesus has seen truth through all eternity. So he knows truth. He is truth personified. He is truth incarnate. And the word became flesh. He has every claim to uh, the term, I am the truth. Jesus is the truth. You know, there's uh, nothing false. There's nothing misleading. There's nothing uncertain. Jesus is the truth. Now, the time that I know about truth, the time I know I better be telling the truth, is when Meryl is asking the questions. We know we find out what truth is about, don't we? I was thinking about uh, the anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. I worked for NASA for 30 years, you know, and one of the highlights was the moon landing, of course. Uh, all the calculations that had to be made by the engineers had to be right. They were made according to what was the truth, scientific truth. Everything had to go exactly right in order for that mission to be accomplished. Now, you know, working for NASA like I did, I probably could have been the first man on the moon, but I happened to be busy on the day of the launch. And I just, I was thinking about too, uh, when I graduated from seminary, I became a state missionary, worked out of Montgomery. We had a missions conference, and there were missionaries invited, international missionaries, missionaries for the U.S., and state missionaries. And pictures had been printed in a little book of all the missionaries, and the children, in order to get to know them better, would take those pictures and find the missionary and get him to give them an autograph. So this little girl came up to me and she handed her book up to me, and before I could sign it, she said, Are you an astronaut? And I said, No, sweetie, I'm not an astronaut. She reached up and got her book and went on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but Buzz, Ald uh, Buzz Aldrin and uh, 
Neil Armstrong, all prepared. They'd gone in orbit around the moon. They were prepared to land. Think about it. They got a message. They got a message from Mission Control, and here's what it said. Guys, you just execute the, the landing just uh, any way you think's best. You don't worry about the calculations. You just use your own judgment. Just uh, whatever feels good to you, you do it. Disaster in a hurry, right? Not using the scientific truth, the engineering truth, preciseness to do what they had to do. Seems to me that's the attitude that's prevalent in our society today. You just do whatever feels good. There's no absolute truth. All of it's relative. There's no one standard. Certainly not the Bible, the standard, not the Scripture. What society decides is what becomes the basis for truth. Truth. I was so impressed this week. I received the magazine from Southern Seminary. And on the front of the magazine were the words, Trusted for Truth. I decided to read the president's article. I opened the magazine up. And Dr. Moeller had his article there. And here's what he said. He said, we, talking about seminary, we have taken the fullness of truth and made it central to our identity and our commitment. We have taken the fullness of truth to identify who we are and what we're committed to. He said, we will teach and stand for the complete and other trustworthiness and truthfulness of the Word of God. We pray that Southern Seminary will be trusted. If we're to be trusted for anything, may all those living know that this seminary is determined to be trusted with the truth. That's good enough for me. <laughs> That's good enough for you. That's good enough for agape. Lord, trust us with the truth. Trust us with the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. Well, the third one is, I am the life. If we follow God's way, if we live by the truth, he says, I'll give you life. I am life. You know, from John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I've come to give them life and to give it more abundantly. The abundant life, the life of joy and freedom and accomplishment through him. The abundant life. But he also says in John 3, 16, that whoever believes on him will not perish, but will have eternal life. So it's both. <laughs> both joy in fulfillment and abundant life now and the eternal life in the future. I am uh, just finished a book. To the ends of the earth. And uh, one of the reasons I could finish it is a small book. I can't, I can't handle the big stuff these days. But that is an interesting book. To the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth. Uh, are, that's the title because the man who wrote it went to the very ends of the earth. Went to uh, northeast China. To a little town named Linden. And Linden, China, very close to the Kazakh border. And what he writes about in here, he was a, he's from Norway. He was a missionary for four years, but had a back injury and had to return home. After he got back home, got a job, Jesus, God spoke to him one time, one night, and said, I want you to go to Hong Kong. When you get to Hong Kong, I'll tell you where to go from there. He couldn't believe that God would ask him to do that. How could he go 5,000 miles and then some further with a back injury he had? But he got his backpack from his granddad. He uh, made preparations to go, bought him a ticket. The morning that he was to leave, he got up, still wondering, restless that night, because how in the world can I travel 5,000 miles? His back pain was gone. It was healed totally. He hadn't had any pain since. The rest of the story is how miracles like that worked to get him from where he was in Norway to the place in China. 
unreal the kinds of things that unfolded before him as God showed him the way to get from where he was to where he wanted him to be. Including, before he actually got in the province where that little town was, he met a guy named David. And David started talking to him about who he was. Turned out he lived in Linden, the China little town. And he was the one who had led 11 people in that town to Christ. Found out that uh, his sister-in-law owned a hotel and she could uh, let him stay in that hotel without registering him with the government because all foreigners were registered with the government. They couldn't be in that. They're not supposed to be there because of the work that was going on there. They, uh, it's a long story, but <laughs> uh, after he got in the country, uh, David was telling him, I'm having a hard time making disciples of those 11 people. And he said, uh, I need help with that, and maybe that's why you come. They got up one morning, and they started walking in the town. And uh, they wanted to get in touch with those 11 people who were scattered all over town. They couldn't get in touch with them by phone. They, they couldn't afford to let that be known. They, couldn't, they didn't even have Facebook. They don't allow Facebook in that part of uh, China. Uh, thank goodness. I'm glad they don't. Is, uh, but... Uh, they walked, and as they walked, soon after they started, one of the 11 guys came running up to him and said, Hey, what are you guys up to? And they told him about the meeting, and he uh, knew the time and the place of the meeting. Before lunch, they had engaged those 11 people, each one of them coming running up to him and saying, What are you doing? or introducing themselves or whatever. They got together. And on the night they got together, uh, Tori, the art, uh, author of this book, explained to them about a church and what a church was and how they needed each other in fellowship. And they organized a church. He spent three weeks getting there. <laughs> he couldn't imagine why God did it, but he said, Jesus wanted a church. That's the first church, first evangelical church in that province and he helped establish. Jesus uh, works through us, and he does in a miraculous kind of way to lead us to do what he wants us to do. I wanted to read just one little bit from the book uh, to tell you the kind of life this guy lived. He says, I know that God is not expecting us to walk like robots waiting for his next command. What he desires is a heart connection. He wants to guide our walk. His thoughts can be our thoughts. He doesn't want us to give him five or ten minutes of the day. He wants to be the center of our day, our week, and essentially our lives. He wants to be the center of our decisions, our victories, our challenges, our sorrows, and our joys. He wants to be the center of our family, our church, our workplace. Most assuredly, he wants to be the navigator of our lives. The Holy Spirit can serve like a GPS that leads us to God's unique plan and purpose for our lives. Lives lived to the fullest. Lives full of joy. Lives full of his power, living in his promises every single day. And every time that we make a wrong turn and start heading away from His purpose, the Holy Spirit will want to guide us back to that route that perfectly aligns us with God's Word and God's heart. <laughs> That's the abundant life. That is the abundant life that God promises us when we give ourselves to Him when we turn our lives over to Him and allow Him to do the miraculous things He needs to do in order to get us to the place that He wants us to be. And no matter where we are, no matter where we are in this journey of life, when we come to that place that we've found a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have reached our destination. We've reached our destination. We not only have abundant life at that place when we receive Christ, we have eternal life. We live eternal life from that time on. 
So Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And that's what he was telling his disciples. He said, don't be troubled. Just trust me. Just follow me. Stand firm in the faith. I'm the truth. Live life to the fullest. And one day, you'll be having life forever with me in that place that I have gone to prepare for you. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, <laughs> they changed the world. I think uh, Cor Ten Boom kind of sums up uh, the lesson today of, about the truth and the way and the life. Uh, you know that Cor Ten Boom was uh, imprisoned in a Nazi prison camp, uh, World War II. Spent months there, devoted Christian, didn't know how long she'd be there, didn't know what was going to happen the next day, didn't know what was happening if she ever got out. So here's what she said. She said, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust the unknown future to a known God. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I'd tell you. I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Thomas said, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the assurance we have that you truly are the way. Lord, uh, it's a blessing that we have grown up in this uh, society where we've been told and taught the way just as you said to the disciples Lord you know the way we know the way we're grateful that we do grateful for your word that comes to us with the truth so this morning we pray that there's someone here who's never found that way that will say I want to make myself Jesus' servant, and I want to follow him. So we uh, just turn this time to you. Pray that anybody that has a decision that they need to make will come and do that in your name. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the invitation is for you to come. If you would uh, make a decision to follow Christ today, if you uh, have been visiting our church and would join us in this fellowship who are trusted with the truth, or if you uh, have any decision, any prayer time, if you have a need in prayer and you want to come to the altar, we invite you to do that. So let's stand together.